Chapter 60 of The Golden Bough. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Golden Bough by Sir James Fraser. Chapter 60 Between Heaven and Earth. Section 1 Not to Touch the Earth. At the outset of this book, two questions were proposed for answer. Why had the priest of Arikia to slay his predecessor? And why, before doing so, had he to pluck the golden bough? Of these two questions, the first has now been answered. The priest of Arikia, if I am right, was one of those sacred kings or human divinities on whose life the welfare of the community and even the course of nature in general are believed to be intimately dependent. It does not appear that the subjects or worshippers of such a spiritual potentate form to themselves any very clear notion of the exact relationship in which they stand to him. Probably their ideas on the point are vague and fluctuating, and we should err if we attempt to define the relationship with logical precision. All that the people know, or rather imagine, is that somehow they themselves, their cattle, and their crops are mysteriously bound up with their divine king, so that according as he is well or ill, the community is healthy or sickly, the flocks and herds thrive or languish with disease, and the fields yield an abundant or a scanty harvest. The worst evil which they can conceive of is the natural death of their ruler, whether he succumb to sickness or old age. For in the opinion of his followers, such a death would entail the most disastrous consequences on themselves and their possessions. Fatal epidemics would sweep away man and beast. The earth would refuse her increase. Nay, the very frame of nature itself might be dissolved. To guard against these catastrophes, it is necessary to put the king to death while he is still in the full bloom of his divine manhood in order that his sacred life, transmitted in unabated force to his successor, may renew its youth, and thus, by successive transmissions through a perpetual line of vigorous incarnations, may remain eternally fresh and young, a pledge and security that men and animals shall in like manner renew their youth by a perpetual succession of generations, and that seed-time and harvest and summer and winter, and rain and sunshine shall never fail. That, if my conjecture is right, is why the priest of Arikia, the king of the wood at Nemi, had regularly to perish by the sword of his successor. But we still have to ask, what was the golden bough? And why had each candidate for the Arikian priesthood to pluck it before they could slay the priest? These questions I will now try to answer. It will be well to begin by noticing two of those rules or taboos by which, as we have seen, the life of divine kings or priests is regulated. The first of these rules, to which I would call the reader's attention, is that the divine personage may not touch the ground with his foot. This rule was observed by the supreme pontiff of the Zapotecs in Mexico, he profaned his sanctity if he so much as touched the ground with his foot. Montezuma, emperor of Mexico, never set foot on the ground. He was always carried on the shoulders of noblemen, and if he lighted anywhere, they laid rich tapestry for him to walk upon. For the Mikado of Japan to touch the ground with his foot was a shameful degradation. Indeed, in the sixteenth century, it was enough to deprive him of his office. Outside his palace, he was carried on men's shoulders. Within it, he walked on exquisitely wrought mats. The king and queen of Tahiti might not touch the ground anywhere but within their hereditary domains, for the ground on which they trod became sacred. In traveling from place to place, they were carried on the shoulders of sacred men. They were always accompanied by several pairs of these sanctified attendants, and when it became necessary to change their bearers, 
the king and queen vaulted on to the shoulders of their new bearers without letting their feet touch the ground. It was an evil omen if the king of Dosuma touched the ground, and he had to perform an expiatory ceremony. Within his palace, the king of Persia walked upon carpets on which no one else might tread. Outside of it, he was never seen on foot, but only in a chariot or on horseback. In old days, the king of Siam never set foot upon the earth, but was carried on a throne of gold from place to place. Formerly, neither the kings of Uganda, nor their mothers, nor their queens might walk on foot outside of the spacious enclosures in which they lived. Whenever they went forth, they were carried on the shoulders of men of the buffalo clan, several of whom accompanied any of these royal personages on a journey, and took it in turn to bear the burden. The king sat astride the bearer's neck with a leg over each shoulder and his feet tucked under the bearer's arm. When one of these royal carriers grew tired, he shot the king onto the shoulders of a second man without allowing the royal feet to touch the ground. In this way, they went at a great pace and traveled long distances in a day when the king was on a journey. The bearers had a special hut in the king's enclosure in order to be at hand the moment they were wanted. Among the Bakuba, or rather Bushongo, a nation in the southern region of the Congo, down to a few years ago, persons of the royal blood were forbidden to touch the ground. They must sit on a hide, a chair, or the back of a slave who crouched on hands and feet. Their feet rested on the feet of others. When they traveled, they were carried on the backs of men, but the king journeyed in a litter supported on shafts. Among the Igbo people of Awka, in southern Nigeria, the priest of the earth has to observe many taboos. For example, he may not see a corpse, and if he meets one on the road, he must hide his eyes with his wristlet. He must abstain from many foods, such as eggs, birds of all sort, mutton, dog, bushbuck, and so forth. He may neither wear nor touch a mask, and no masked man may enter his house. If a dog enters his house, it is killed and thrown out. As priest of the earth, he may not sit on the bare ground, nor eat things that have fallen on the ground, nor may earth be thrown at him. According to ancient Brahmanic ritual, a king at his inauguration trod in a tiger's skin and a golden plate, he was shod with shoes of boar's skin, and so long as he lived thereafter, he may not stand on the earth with his bare feet. But besides persons who are permanently sacred or tabooed, and are therefore permanently forbidden to touch the ground with their feet, there are others who enjoy the character of sanctity or taboo only on certain occasions and to whom accordingly the prohibition in question only applies at the definite seasons during which they exhale the odor of sanctity. Thus, among the Kenyans or Bahaus of central Borneo, while the priestesses are engaged in the performance of certain rites, they may not step on the ground, and boards are laid for them to tread on. Warriors, again, on the warpath are surrounded, so to say, by an atmosphere of taboo, Hence, some Indians of North America might not sit on the bare ground the whole time they were out on a warlike expedition. In Laos, the hunting of elephants gives rise to many taboos. One of them is that the chief hunter may not touch the earth with his foot. Accordingly, when he alights from his elephant, the others spread a carpet of leaves for him to step upon. Apparently, holiness, magical virtue, taboo, or whatever we may call that mysterious quality which is supposed to pervade sacred or tabooed persons, is conceived by the primitive philosopher as a physical substance or fluid with which the sacred man is charged just as a Leyden jar is charged with electricity, and exactly as the electricity in the jar can be discharged by contact with a good conductor, so the holiness or magical virtue in the man can be discharged and drained away by contact with the earth, which on this theory serves as an excellent conductor for the magical fluid. Hence, 
in order to preserve the charge from running to waste, the sacred or tabooed personage must be carefully prevented from touching the ground; in electrical language he must be insulated. If he is not to be emptied of the precious substance or fluid with which he, as a vial, is filled to the brim, and in many cases apparently the insulation of the tabooed person is recommended as a precaution not merely for his own sake, but for the sake of others. For since the virtue of holiness or taboo is, so to say, a powerful explosive which the smallest touch may detonate, it is necessary in the interest of the general safety to keep it within narrow bounds, lest breaking out it should blast, blight, and destroy whatever it comes into contact with. Section 2. Not to see the sun. The second rule to be noted is that the sun may not shine upon the divine person. This rule was observed both by the Mikado and by the pontiffs of the Zapotecs. The latter, quote, was looked upon as a god whom the earth was not worthy to hold, nor the sun to shine upon. Close quote. The Japanese would not allow that the Mikado should expose his sacred person to the open air, and the sun was not thought worthy to shine on his head. The Indians of Grenada in South America quote, kept those who were to be rulers or commanders, whether men or women, locked up for several years when they were children, some of them seven years, and this so close that they were not to see the sun, for if they should happen to see it, they forfeited their lordship, eating certain sorts of food appointed, and those who were their keepers at certain times went into their retreat or prison and scourged them severely. Close quote. Thus, for example, the heir to the throne of Bogota, who was not the son but the sister's son of the king, had to undergo a rigorous training from his infancy. He lived in complete retirement in a temple, where he might not see the sun, nor eat salt, nor converse with a woman. He was surrounded by guards who observed his conduct and noted all his actions. If he broke a single one of the rules laid down for him, he was deemed infamous and forfeited all his rights to the throne. So, too, the heir to the kingdom of Sagomoso, before succeeding to the crown, had to fast for seven years in the temple, being shut up in the dark and not allowed to see the sun or light. The prince who was to become Inca of Peru had to fast for a month without seeing light. Section 3. The Seclusion of Girls at Puberty Now it is remarkable that the foregoing two rules, not to touch the ground and not to see the sun, are observed either separately or conjointly by girls at puberty in many parts of the world. Thus, amongst the negroes of the Wango girls at puberty are confined in separate huts, and they may not touch the ground with any part of their bare body. Among the Zulus and kindred tribes of South Africa, when the first signs of puberty show themselves, quote, while a girl is walking, gathering wood, or working in the field, she runs to the river and hides herself among the reeds for a day so as not to be seen by men. She covers her head carefully with her blanket that the sun may not shine on it and shrivel her up into a withered skeleton, as would result from exposure to the sun's beams. After dark, she returns to her home and is secluded, close quote, in a hut for some time. With the Awakonde, a tribe at the northern end of Lake Nyasa, it is a rule that after her first menstruation, a girl must be kept apart, with a few companions of her own sex, in a darkened house. The floor is covered with dry banana leaves, but no fire may be lit in the house, which is called the house of the Awasungu, that is, of the maidens who have no hearts. In New Ireland, girls are confined for four or five years in small cages, being kept in the dark and not allowed to set foot on the ground. The custom has been thus described by an eyewitness. Quote, 
I heard from a teacher about some strange custom connected with some of the young girls here, so I asked the chief to take me to the house where they were. The house was about twenty five feet in length, and stood in a reed and bamboo enclosure, across the entrance to which a bundle of dried grass was suspended to show that it was strictly taboo. Inside the house were three conical structures about seven or eight feet in height, and about ten or twelve feet in circumference at the bottom, and for about four feet from the ground, at which point they tapered off to a point at the top. These cages were made of the broad leaves of the pandanus tree, sewn quite close together so that no light and little or no air could enter. On one side of each is an opening, which is closed by a double door of plaited coconut tree and pandanus tree leaves. About three feet from the ground, there is a stage of bamboos which forms the floor. In each of these cages, we were told there was a young woman confined, each of whom had to remain for at least four or five years without ever being allowed to go outside the house. I could scarcely credit the story when I heard it, the whole thing seemed too horrible to be true. I spoke to the chief and told him that I wished to see the inside of the cages, and also to see the girls that I might make them a present of a few beads. He told me that it was taboo, forbidden for any men but their own relations to look at them. But I suppose the promised beads acted as an inducement, and so he sent away for some old lady who had charge and who alone is allowed to open the doors. While we were waiting, we could hear the girls talking to the chief in a querulous way, as if objecting to something or expressing their fears. An old woman came at length, and certainly she did not seem a very pleasant jailer or guardian, nor did she seem to favor the request of the chief to allow us to see the girls, as she regarded us with anything but pleasant looks. However, she had to undo the door when the chief told her to do so, and then the girls peeped out at us, and when told to do so, they held out their hands for the beads. I, however, purposely sat at some distance away and merely held out the beads to them, as I wished to draw them quite outside that I might inspect the inside of the cages. This desire of mine gave rise to another difficulty, as these girls were not allowed to put their feet to the ground all the time they were confined in these places. However, they wished to get the beads, and so the old lady had to go outside and collect a lot of pieces of wood and bamboo, which she placed on the ground, and then going to one of the girls, she helped her down and held her hand as she stepped from one piece of wood to another until she came near enough to get the beads I held out to her. I then went to inspect the inside of the cage out of which she had come, but could scarcely put my head inside of it. The atmosphere was so hot and stifling. It was clean, and contained nothing but a few short lengths of bamboo for holding water. There was only room for the girl to sit or lie down in a crouched position on the bamboo platform, and when the doors are shut, it must be nearly or quite dark inside. The girls are never allowed to come out, except once a day to bathe in a dish or wooden bowl placed close to each cage. They say that they perspire profusely. They are placed in these stifling cages when quite young, and must remain there until they are young women, when they are taken out and have each a great marriage feast provided for them. One of them was about fourteen or fifteen years old, and the chief told us that she had been there for five years but would soon be taken out now. The other two were about eight and ten years old, and they have to stay there for several years longer. Close quote. In Kabadi, a district of British New Guinea, quote, daughters of chiefs, when they are about twelve or thirteen years of age, are kept indoors for two or three years, never being allowed under any pretense to descend from the house and the house is so shaded that the sun cannot shine on them. Close quote. Among the Yabim and Bukawa, two neighboring and kindred tribes on the coast of northern New Guinea, a girl at puberty is secluded for some five or six weeks 
in an inner part of the house, but she may not sit on the floor lest her uncleanliness should cleave to it, so a log of wood is placed for her to squat on. Moreover, she may not touch the ground with her feet. Hence, if she is obliged to quit the house for a short time, she is muffled up in mats and walks on two halves of a coconut shell, which are fastened like sandals to her feet by creeping plants. Among the Ot Denoms of Borneo, girls at the age of eight or ten years are shut up in a little room or cell of the house and cut off from all intercourse with the world for a long time. The cell, like the rest of the house, is raised on piles above the ground and is lit by a single small window opening on a lonely place, so that the girl is in almost total darkness. She may not leave the room on any pretext whatever, not even for the most necessary purposes. None of her family may see her all the time she is shut up, but a single slave woman is appointed to wait on her. During her lonely confinement, which often lasts seven years, the girl occupies herself in weaving mats or with other handiwork. Her bodily growth is stunted by the long want of exercise, and when, on attaining womanhood, she is brought out, her complexion is pale and wax-like. She is now shown the sun, the earth, the water, the trees, and the flowers, as if she were newly born. Then a great feast is made, a slave is killed, and the girl is smeared with his blood. In Sarum, girls at puberty were formerly shut up by themselves in a hut which was kept dark. In Yap, one of the Caroline Islands, should a girl be overtaken by her first menstruation on the public road, she may not sit down on the earth, but must beg for a coconut shell to put under her. She is shut up for several days in a small hut at a distance from her parents' house, and afterwards she is bound to sleep for a hundred days in one of the special houses which are provided for the use of menstruous women. In the island of Mabweg, Torres Straits, when the signs of puberty appear on a girl, a circle of bushes is made in a dark corner of the house. Here, decked with shoulder belts, armlets, leglets just below the knees and anklets, wearing a chaplet on her head and shell ornaments in her ears, on her chest and on her back, she squats in the midst of the bushes which are piled so high round about her that only her head is visible. In this state of seclusion, she must remain for three months. All this time the sun may not shine upon her, but at night she is allowed to slip out of the hut, and the bushes that hedge her in are then changed. She may not feed herself or handle food, but is fed by one or two old women, her maternal aunts, who are especially appointed to look after her. One of these women cooks food for her at a special fire in the forest. The girl is forbidden to eat turtle or turtle's eggs during the season when the turtles are breeding, but no vegetable food is refused her. No man, not even her own father, may come into the house while her seclusion lasts, for if her father saw her at this time, he would certainly have bad luck in his fishing, and would probably smash his canoe the very next time he went out in it. At the end of three months, she is carried down to a freshwater creek by her attendants, hanging on to their shoulders in such a way that her feet do not touch the ground, while the women of the tribe form a ring round her and thus escort her back to the beach. Arrived at the shore, she is stripped of her ornaments, and the bearers stagger with her into the creek, while they immerse her and all the other women join in splashing water over both the girl and her bearers. When they come out of the water, one of the two attendants makes a heap of grass for her to charge and squat upon. The others run to the reef, catches a small crab, tears off its claws, and hastens back with them to the creek. Here, in the meantime, a fire has been kindled and the claws are roasted at it. The girl is then fed by her attendants with the roasted claws. After that, she is freshly decorated and the whole party marches back to the village in a single rank, the girl walking in the center between her two old aunts, who hold her by the wrists. 
the husbands of her aunts now receive her and lead her into the house of one of them, where all partake of food, and the girl is allowed once more to feed herself in the usual manner. A dance follows, in which the girl takes a prominent part, dancing between the husbands of the two aunts who had charge of her in her retirement. Among the Yarikana tribe of North York Peninsula in northern Queensland, a girl at puberty is said to live by herself for a month or six weeks. No man may see her, though any woman may. She stays in a hut or shelter specially made for her, on the floor of which she lies supine. She may not see the sun, and towards sunset she must keep her eyes shut until the sun has gone down. Otherwise, it is thought that her nose will be diseased. During her seclusion, she may eat nothing that lives in salt water, or a snake would kill her. An old woman waits upon her, and supplies her with roots, yams, and water. Some Australian tribes are wont to bury their girls at such seasons more or less deeply in the ground, perhaps in order to hide them from the light of the sun. Among the Indians of California, a girl at her first menstruation, quote, was thought to be possessed of a particular degree of supernatural power, and this was not always regarded as entirely defiling or malevolent. Often, however, there was a strong feeling of the power of evil inherent in her condition. Not only was she secluded from her family and her community, but an attempt was made to seclude the world from her. One of the injunctions most strongly laid upon her was not to look about her. She kept her head bowed, and was forbidden to see the world and the sun. Some tribes covered her with a blanket. Many of the customs in this connection resemble those of the North Pacific coast most strongly, such as the prohibition to the girl to touch or scratch her head with her hand, a special implement being furnished her for the purpose. Sometimes she could only eat when fed, and in other cases fasted altogether. Close quote. Among the Chinook Indians, who inhabited the coast of Washington State, when a chief's daughter attained to puberty, she was hidden for five days from the view of the people. She might not look at them, nor at the sky, nor might she pick berries. It was believed that if she were to look at the sky, the weather would be bad, that if she picked berries it would rain, and that when she hung her towel of cedar bark on a spruce tree, the tree withered up at once. She went out of the house by a separate door and bathed in a creek far from the village. She fasted for some days, and for many days more she might not eat fresh food. Amongst the Ott, or Nootka Indians of Vancouver Island, when girls reach puberty, they are placed in a sort of gallery in the house, quote, and are there surrounded completely with mats, so that neither the sun nor any fire can be seen. In this cage they remain for several days. Water is given them, but no food. The longer a girl remains in this retirement, the greater honor it is to the parents. But she is disgraced for life if it is known that she has seen fire or the sun during this initiatory ordeal. Close quote. Pictures of the mythical Thunderbird are painted on the screens behind which she hides. During her seclusion, she may neither move nor lie down, but must always sit in a squatting posture. She may not touch her hair with her hands, but is allowed to scratch her head with a comb or a piece of bone provided for the purpose. To scratch her body is also forbidden, as it is believed that every scratch would leave a scar. For eight months after reaching maturity, she may not eat any fresh food, particularly salmon. Moreover, she must eat by herself and use a cup and dish of her own. In the Tsetsout tribe of British Columbia, a girl at puberty wears a large hat of skin which comes down over her face and screens it from the sun. It is believed that if she were to expose her face to the sun or to the sky, rain would fall. The hat protects her face also against the fire, which ought not to strike her skin. To shield her hands, she wears mittens. 
In her mouth she carries the tooth of an animal to prevent her own teeth from becoming hollow. For a whole year she may not see blood unless her face is blackened; otherwise she would grow blind. For two years she wears the hat and lives in a hut by herself, although she is allowed to see other people. At the end of two years a man takes the hat from her head and throws it away. In the Bilcoola or Bellacoola tribe of British Columbia, when a girl attains puberty, she must stay in the shed which serves as her bedroom, where she has a separate fireplace. She is not allowed to descend to the main part of the house and may not sit by the fire of the family. For four days she is bound to remain motionless in a sitting posture. She fasts during the day, but is allowed a little food and drink very early in the morning. After the four days' seclusion, she may leave her room, but only through a separate opening cut in the floor, for the houses are raised on piles. She may not yet come into the chief room. In leaving the house, she wears a large hat, which protects her face against the rays of the sun. It is believed that if the sun were to shine on her face, her eyes would suffer. She may pick berries on the hills, but may not come near the river or sea for a whole year. Were she to eat fresh salmon, she would lose her senses, or her mouth would be changed into a long beak. Amongst the Tlingit, or Tlingit, or Kulosh Indians of Alaska, when a girl shows signs of womanhood, she used to be confined to a little hut or cage, which was completely blocked up with the exception of a small air hole. In this dark and filthy abode, she had to remain a year without fire, exercise, or associates. Only her mother and a female slave might supply her with nourishment. Her food was put in at the little window. She had to drink out of the wing bone of a white-headed eagle. The time of her seclusion was afterwards reduced in some places to six or three months or even less. She had to wear a sort of hat with long flaps that her gaze might not pollute the sky, for she was thought unfit for the sun to shine upon, and it was imagined that her look would destroy the luck of a hunter, fisher, or gambler, turn things to stone, and do other mischief. At the end of her confinement, her clothes were burnt, new ones were made, and a feast was given, at which a slit was cut in her underlip parallel to the mouth, and a piece of wood or shell was inserted to keep the aperture open. Among the Konyags, an Eskimo people of Alaska, a girl at puberty was placed in a small hut in which she had to remain on her hands and feet for six months. Then the hut was enlarged a little so as to allow her to straighten her back, but in this posture she had to remain for six months more. All this time she was regarded as an unclean being with whom no one might hold intercourse. When symptoms of puberty appeared on a girl for the first time, the Guranis of southern Brazil on the borders of Paraguay used to sew her up in a hammock leaving only a small opening in it to allow her to breathe. In this condition, wrapped up and shrouded like a corpse, she was kept for two or three days, or so long as the symptoms lasted, and during this time she had to observe a most rigorous fast. After that, she was entrusted to a matron, who cut the girl's hair and enjoined her to abstain most strictly from eating flesh of any kind until her hair should be grown long enough to hide her ears. In similar circumstances, the Chiriguanos of southeastern Bolivia hoisted the girl in her hammock to the roof, where she stayed for a month. The second month, the hammock was let halfway down from the roof, and in the third month, old women armed with sticks entered the hut and ran about striking everything they met, saying they were hunting the snake that had wounded the girl. Among the Matacos, or Matagayos, an Indian tribe of the Gran Chaco, a girl at puberty has to remain in seclusion for some time. She lies covered up with branches or other things in a corner of the hut, 
seeing no one and speaking to no one, and during this time she may eat neither flesh nor fish. Meantime, a man beats a drum in front of the house. Among the Yuracares, an Indian tribe of eastern Bolivia, when a girl perceives the signs of puberty, her father constructs a little hut of palm trees near the house. In this cabin, he shuts up his daughter so that she cannot see the light, and there she remains fasting rigorously for four days. Amongst the Makusis of British Guiana, when a girl shows the first signs of puberty, she is hung in a hammock at the highest point of the hut. For the first few days she may not leave the hammock by day, but at night she must come down, light a fire, and spend the night beside it, else she would break out in sores on her neck, throat, and other parts of her body. So long as the symptoms are at their height, she must fast rigorously. When they have abated, she may come down and take up her abode in a little compartment that is made for her in the darkest corner of the hut. In the morning, she may cook her food, but it must be at a separate fire and in a vessel of her own. After about ten days, the magician comes and undoes the spell by muttering charms and breathing on her and on the more valuable of the things with which she has come in contact. The pots and drinking vessels which she used are broken and the fragments buried. After her first bath, the girl must submit to be beaten by her mother with thin rods without uttering a cry. At the end of the second period, she is again beaten, but not afterwards. She is now clean and can mix again with people. The Indians of Guiana, after keeping the girl in her hammock at the top of the hut for a month, expose her to certain large ants, whose bite is very painful. Sometimes, in addition to being stung with ants, the sufferer has to fast day and night, so long as she remains slung up on high in her hammock, so that when she comes down, she is reduced to a skeleton. When a Hindu maiden reaches maturity, she is kept in a dark room for four days and is forbidden to see the sun. She is regarded as unclean. No one may touch her. Her diet is restricted to boiled rice, milk, sugar, curds, and camarind without salt. On the morning of the fifth day, she goes to a neighboring tank accompanied by five women whose husbands are alive. Smeared with turmeric water, they all bathe and return home, throwing away the mat and other things that were in the room. The Rahri Brahmans of Bengal compel a girl at puberty to live alone and do not allow her to see the face of any male. For three days she remains shut up in a dark room and has to undergo certain penances. Fish, flesh, and sweetmeats are forbidden her. She must live upon rice and ghee. Among the Tians of Malabar, a girl is thought to be polluted for four days from the beginning of her first menstruation. During this time, she must keep to the north side of the house, where she sleeps on a grass mat of a particular kind, in a room festooned with garlands of young coconut leaves. Another girl keeps her company and sleeps with her, but she may not touch any other person, tree, or plant. Further, she may not see the sky, and woe betide her if she catches sight of a crow or a cat. Her diet must be strictly vegetarian, without salt, tamarinds, or chilies. She is armed against evil spirits by a knife, which is placed on the mat or carried on her person. In Cambodia, a girl at puberty is put to bed under a mosquito curtain, where she should stay a hundred days. Usually, however, four, five, ten, or twenty days is thought enough, and even this in a hot climate and under the close meshes of the curtain is sufficiently trying. According to another account, a Cambodian maiden at puberty is said to, quote, enter into the shade, close quote. During her retirement, which, according to the rank and position of her family, may last any time from a few days to several years, she has to observe a number of rules, such as not to be seen by a strange man, 
not to eat flesh or fish, and so on. She goes nowhere, not even to the pagoda. But this state of seclusion is discontinued during eclipses. At such times she goes forth and pays her devotions to the monster who is supposed to cause eclipses by catching the heavenly bodies between his teeth. This permission to break her rule of retirement and appear abroad during an eclipse seems to show how literally the injunction is interpreted which forbids maidens entering on womanhood to look upon the sun. A superstition so widely diffused as this might be expected to leave traces in legends and folk tales, and it has done so. The Greek story of Danae, who was confined by her father in a subterranean chamber or a brazen tower, but impregnated by Zeus, who reached her in the shape of a shower of gold, perhaps belongs to this class of tales. It has its counterpart in the legend which the Kyrgyz of Siberia tell of their ancestry. A certain Khan had a fair daughter, whom he kept in a dark iron house that no man might see her. An old woman tended her, and when the girl was grown to maidenhood, she asked the old woman, Where do you go so often? My child, said the dame, there is a bright world. In that bright world your father and mother live, and all sorts of people live there. That is where I go. The maiden said, Good mother, I will tell nobody, but show me that bright world. So the old woman took the girl out of the iron house. But when she saw the bright world, the girl tottered and fainted, and the eye of God fell upon her, and she conceived. Her angry father put her in a golden chest, and sent her floating away over the wide sea. The shower of gold in the Greek story, and the eye of God in the Kyrgyz legend, probably stand for sunlight and the sun. The idea that women may be impregnated by the sun is not uncommon in legends, and there are even traces of it in marriage customs. Section 4. Reasons for the Seclusion of Girls at Puberty The motive for the restraints so commonly imposed on girls at puberty is the deeply ingrained dread which primitive man universally entertains of menstruous blood. He fears it at all times, but especially on its first appearance. Hence, the restrictions under which women lie at their first menstruation are usually more stringent than those which they have to observe at any subsequent recurrence of the mysterious flow. Some evidence of the fear and of the customs based on it has been cited in an earlier part of this work. But as the terror, for it is nothing less, which the phenomenon periodically strikes into the mind of the savage, has deeply influenced his life and institutions. It may be well to illustrate the subject with some further examples. Thus, in the Encounter Bay tribe of South Australia, there is, or used to be, a, quote, superstition which obliges a woman to separate herself from the camp at the time of her monthly illness when if a young man or boy should approach she calls out and he immediately makes a circuit to avoid her if she is negligent upon this point she exposes herself to scolding and sometimes to severe beating by her husband or nearest relation because the boys are told from their infancy that if they see the blood they will early become gray-headed and their strength will fail prematurely the diary of central australia believe that if a woman at these times were to eat fish or bathe in a river the fish would all die and the water would dry up the arunta of the same region forbid menstruous women to gather the iriakura bulbs which form a staple article of diet for both men and women they think that were a woman to break this rule the supply of bulbs would fail in some Australian tribes, the seclusion of menstruous women was even more rigid, and was enforced by severer penalties than a scolding or a beaten. Thus, quote, 
There is a regulation relating to camps in the Wakelbura tribe which forbids the women coming into the encampment by the same path as the men. Any violation of this rule would in a large camp be punished with death. The reason for this is the dread with which they regard the menstrual period of women. During such a time, a woman is kept entirely away from the camp, half a mile at least. A woman in such condition has boughs of some tree of her totem tied round her loins and is constantly watched and guarded, for it is thought that should any male be so unfortunate as to see a woman in such a condition, he would die. If such a woman were to let herself be seen by a man, she would probably be put to death. When the woman has recovered, she is painted red and white, her head covered with feathers, and returns to the camp. Close quote. In Muralug, one of the Torres Straits Islands, a menstruous woman may not eat anything that lives in the sea, else the natives believe that the fisheries would fail. In Galela, to the west of New Guinea, women at their monthly periods may not enter a tobacco field, or the plants would be attacked by disease. The Minang Kabauers of Sumatra are persuaded that if a woman in her unclean state were to go near a rice field, the crop would be spoiled. The Bushmen of South Africa think that, by a glance of a girl's eye at the time when she ought to be kept in strict retirement, men become fixed in whatever positions they happen to occupy, with whatever they were holding in their hands, and are changed into trees that talk. Cattle-rearing tribes of South Africa hold that their cattle would die if the milk were drunk by a menstruous woman, and they fear the same disaster if a drop of her blood were to fall on the ground and the oxen were to pass over it. To prevent such a calamity, women in general, not menstruous women only, are forbidden to enter the cattle enclosure, and more than that, they may not use the ordinary paths in entering the village or in passing from one hut to another. They are obliged to make circuitous tracks at the back of the huts in order to avoid the ground in the middle of the village where the cattle stand or lie down. These women's tracks may be seen at every Caffrey village. Among the Baganda, in like manner, no menstruous woman might drink milk or come into contact with any milk vessel, and she might not touch anything that belonged to her husband nor sit on his mat, nor cook his food. If she touched anything of his at such a time, it was deemed equivalent to wishing him dead, or to actually working magic for his destruction. Were she to handle any article of his, he would surely fall ill. Were she to touch his weapons, he would certainly be killed in the next battle. Further, the Banganda would not suffer a menstruous woman to visit a well. If she did so, they feared that the water would dry up, and that she herself would fall sick and die, unless she confessed her fault and the medicine man made atonement for her. Among the Akikuyu of British East Africa, if a new hut is built in a village, and the wife chances to menstruate in it on the day she lights the first fire there, the hut must be broken down and demolished the very next day. The woman may on no account sleep a second night in it. There is a curse both on her and on it. According to the Talmud, if a woman at the beginning of her period passes between two men, she thereby kills one of them. Peasants of the Lebanon think that menstruous women are the cause of many misfortunes. Their shadow causes flowers to wither and trees to perish, it even arrests the movements of serpents. If one of them mounts a horse, the animal might die, or at least be disabled for a long time. The Gaikiris of the Orinoco believe that when a woman has her courses, everything upon which she steps will die, and that if a man treads on the place where she has passed, his legs will immediately swell up. Among the Bribri Indians of Costa Rica, a married woman at her periods uses for plates only banana leaves, which, 
when she has done with them, she throws away in a sequestered spot. For should a cow find and eat them, the animal would waste away and perish. Also, she drinks only out of a special vessel, because any person who should afterwards drink out of the same vessel would infallibly pine away and die. Among the tribes of North American Indians, the custom was that women in their courses retired from the camp or the village and lived during the time of their uncleanness in special huts or shelters which were appropriated for their use. There they dwelt apart, eating and sleeping by themselves, warming themselves at their own fires, and strictly abstaining from all communications with men who shunned them just as if they were stricken with the plague. Thus, to take examples, the Creek and kindred Indians of the United States compelled women at menstruation to live in separate huts at some distance from the village. There, the women had to stay, at the risk of being surprised and cut off by enemies. It was thought, quote, a most horrid and dangerous pollution, close quote, to go near the women at such times, and the danger extended to enemies who, if they slew the women, had to cleanse themselves from the pollution by means of certain sacred herbs and roots. The Sticialis Indians of British Columbia imagined that if a menstruous woman were to step over a bundle of arrows, the arrows would thereby be rendered useless, and might even cause the death of their owner, and similarly, that if she passed in front of a hunter who carried a gun, the weapon would never shoot straight again. Among the Chippeways and other Indians of the Hudson Bay Territory, menstruous women are excluded from the camp, and take up their abode in huts of branches. They wear long hoods, which effectually conceal the head and breast. They may not touch the household furniture, nor any objects used by men, for their touch is supposed to defile them, so that their subsequent use would be followed by certain mischief or misfortune, such as disease or death. They must drink out of a swan's bone. They may not walk on the common paths, nor cross the tracks of animals. They, quote, are never permitted to walk on the ice of rivers or lakes, or near the part where the men are hunting beaver, or where a fishing net is set, for fear of averting their success. They are also prohibited at those times from partaking of the head of any animal, and even from walking in or crossing the track where the head of a deer, moose, beaver, and many other animals have lately been carried, either on a sledge or on the back. To be guilty of a violation of this custom is considered as of the greatest importance, because they firmly believe that it would be a means of preventing the hunter from having an equal success in his future excursions. So the Laps forbid women at menstruation to walk on that part of the shore where the fishers are in the habit of setting out their fish. And the Eskimo of Bering Strait believe that if hunters were to come near women in their courses, they would catch no game. For a like reason, the carrier Indians will not suffer a menstruous woman to cross the tracks of animals. If need be, she is carried over by them. They think that if she waited in a stream or a lake, the fish would die. Amongst the civilized nations of Europe, the superstitions which cluster round this mysterious aspect of women's nature are not less extravagant than those which prevail among savages. In the oldest existing cyclopedia, The Natural History of Pliny, the list of dangers apprehended from menstruation is longer than any furnished by mere barbarians. According to Pliny, the touch of a menstruous woman turned wine to vinegar, blighted crops, killed seedlings, blasted gardens, brought down the fruit from trees, dimmed mirrors, blunted razors, rusted iron and brass, especially at the waning of the moon, killed bees, or at least drove them from their hives, caused mares to miscarry, and so forth. Similarly, in various parts of Europe, it is still believed that if a woman in her courses enters a brewery 
the beer will turn sour. If she touches beer, wine, vinegar, or milk, it will go bad. If she makes jam, it will not keep. If she mounts a mare, it will miscarry. If she touches buds, they will wither. If she climbs a cherry tree, it will die. In Brunswick, people think that if a menstruous woman assists in the killing of a pig, the pork will putrefy. In the Greek island of Kalimnos, a woman at such times may not go to the well to draw water, nor cross a running stream, nor enter the sea. Her presence in a boat is said to raise storms. Thus, the object of secluding women at menstruation is to neutralize the dangerous influences which are supposed to emanate from them at such times. That the danger is believed to be especially great at the first menstruation appears from the unusual precautions taken to isolate girls at this crisis. Two of these precautions have been illustrated above, namely, the rules that the girls may not touch the ground nor see the sun. The general effect of these rules is to keep her suspended, so to say, between heaven and earth. Whether enveloped in her hammock and slung up to the roof, as in South America, or raised above the ground in a dark and narrow cage, as in New Ireland, she may be considered to be out of the way if doing mischief, since, being shut off from both the earth and from the sun, she can poison neither of these great sources of life by her deadly contagion. In short, she is rendered harmless by being, in electrical language, insulated. But the precautions thus taken to isolate or insulate the girl are dictated by a regard for her own safety as well as for the safety of others. For it is thought that she herself would suffer if she were to neglect the prescribed regimen. Thus, Zulu girls, as we have seen, believe that they would shrivel to skeletons if the sun were to shine on them at puberty. And the Makusas imagine that if a young woman were to transgress the rules, she would suffer from sores on various parts of her body. In short, the girl is viewed as charged with a powerful force which, if not kept within bounds, may prove destructive both to herself and to all with whom she comes in contact. To repress this force within the limits necessary for the safety of all concerned is the object of the taboos in question. The same explanation applies to the observance of the same rules by divine kings and priests. The uncleanness, as it is called, of girls at puberty and the sanctity of holy men do not, to the primitive mind, differ materially from each other. They are only different manifestations of the same mysterious energy which, like energy in general, is in itself neither good nor bad, but becomes beneficent or maleficent according to its application. Accordingly, if, like girls at puberty, divine personages may neither touch the ground nor see the sun, the reason is, on the one hand, a fear lest their divinity might, at contact with earth or heaven, discharge itself with fatal violence on ether, and, on the other hand, an apprehension that the divine being, thus drained of his ethereal virtue, might thereby be incapacitated for the future performance of those magical functions, upon the proper discharge of which the safety of the people and even of the world is believed to hang. Thus the rules in question fall under the head of the taboos, which we examined in an earlier part of this book. They are intended to preserve the life of the divine person, and with it the life of his subjects and worshippers. Nowhere, it is thought, can a precious yet dangerous life be at once so safe and so harmless as when it is neither in heaven nor in earth, but, as far as possible, suspended between the two. Chapter 61. The Myth of Balder A deity whose life might in a sense be said to be neither in heaven nor on earth but between the two was the Norse Balder, the good and beautiful god, 
the son of the great god Odin, and himself the wisest, mildest, best beloved of all the immortals. The story of his death, as it is told in the younger or prose Edda, runs thus. Once in a time, Balder dreamed heavy dreams which seemed to forebode his death. Thereupon, the gods held a council and resolved to make him secure against every danger. So the goddess Frigg took an oath from fire and water, iron and all metals, stone and earth, from trees, sicknesses and poisons, and from all four-footed beasts, birds and creeping things, that they would not hurt Balder. When this was done, Balder was deemed invulnerable, so the gods amused themselves by setting him in their midst, while some shot at him, others hewed at him, and others threw stones at him. But whatever they did, nothing could hurt him, and at this they were all glad. Only Loki, the mischief-maker, was displeased, and he went in the guise of an old woman to Frigg, who told him that the weapons of the gods could not wound Balder, since she had made them all swear not to hurt him. Then Loki asked, Have all these things sworn to spare Balder? She answered, East of Valhalla grows a plant called mistletoe. It seemed to me too young to swear. So Loki went and pulled the mistletoe, and took it to the assembly of the gods. There he found the blind god Holter standing at the outside of the circle. Loki asked him, why do you not shoot at Balder? Holter answered, Because I do not see where he stands. Besides, I have no weapon. Then Loki said, Do like the rest, and show Balder honor as they do. I will show you where he stands, and you will shoot him with this twig. Holter took the mistletoe and threw it at Balder as Loki directed him. The mistletoe struck Balder, and pierced him through and through, and he fell down dead. And that was the greatest misfortune that ever befell gods and men. For a while, the gods stood speechless. Then they lifted up their voices and wept bitterly. They took Balder's body and brought it to the seashore. There stood Balder's ship. It was called Ringhorn and was the hugest of all ships. The gods wished to launch the ship and to burn Balder's body on it, but the ship would not stir. So they sent for a giantess called Hyrokin. She came riding on a wolf, and gave the ship such a push that fire flashed from the rollers and all the earth shook. Then Balder's body was taken and placed on the funeral pile upon his ship. When his wife Nana saw that, her heart burst for sorrow, and she died. So she was laid on the funeral pile with her husband, and fire was put to it. Balder's horse, too, with all its trappings, was burned on the pile. Whether he was a real or merely a mythical personage, Balder was worshipped in Norway. On one of the bays of the beautiful Sange Fjord, which penetrates far into the depths of the solemn Norwegian mountains, with their somber pine forests and their lofty cascades dissolving into spray before they reach the dark water of the fjord below, Balder had a great sanctuary. It was called Balder's Grove. A palisade enclosed the hallowed ground, and within it stood a spacious temple with the images of many gods but none of them was worshipped with such devotion as Balder. So great was the awe with which the heathen regarded the place, that no man might harm another there, nor steal his cattle, nor defile himself with women. But women cared for the images of the gods in the temple. They warmed them at the fire, anointed them with oil, and dried them with cloths. Whatever may be thought of an historical kernel underlying a mythical husk in the legend of Balder, the details of the story suggest that it belongs to that class of myths which have been dramatized and ritual, or, to put it otherwise, which have been performed as magical ceremonies for the sake of producing those natural effects 
which they describe in figurative language. A myth is never so graphic and precise in its details as when it is, so to speak, the book of the words which are spoken and acted by the performers of the sacred rite. That the Norse story of Balder was a myth of this sort will become probable if we can prove that ceremonies resembling the incidents in the tale have been performed by Norsemen and other European peoples. Now, the main incidents in the tale are two. First, the pulling of the mistletoe, and second, the death and burning of the god, and both of them may perhaps be found to have had their counterparts in yearly rites observed, whether separately or conjointly, by people in various parts of Europe. These rites will be described and discussed in the following chapters. We shall begin with the annual festivals of fire, and shall reserve the pulling of the mistletoe for consideration later on. End of chapter 61